Okay, uh, so everyone, what we're going to do is we're going to continue with our discussions on unimolecular reactions in this uh, in this video, and especially we are going to talk about SN one reactions of alkyl halides. So, uh, and what I want you to remember from the first video is that always or this is along with E1 all the time. Okay, but what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the mechanism of the SN1 reaction in this video and some other attributes of an SN1 reaction. And then we'll go look at the mechanism of an E1 reaction and then attributes of E1 reaction in a following video. So for an SN1 reaction, so to start, uh, as an example, we have that alkyl bromide, this is tertiary, and what we saw is you react this with a solvent, or if you heat it in a solvent, not react with a solvent, if you heat this in a solvent, so essentially reflux it or just heat it mildly, depending, the rate would vary, but when you react it with a solvent in presence of heat, what you get is you get two products, a substitution product, and an elimination product. So this is an SN1 product, and this is the E1 product. And so what we're going to do is, in this video, we're going to focus on the SN1 product. How does that product, how do we get that product, what happens, what's the mechanism like, and then learn other things about the reaction. But again, as I wrote here, this reaction, whenever it happens, E1 reaction is also going on. You're getting products from E1 as well, okay, simultaneously. Okay, so what is the mechanism of this reaction? So now what, I, what we saw earlier is that the rate of this reaction depends only on the concentration of the alkyl halide. So based on that, and there are other reasons actually, okay, so, and maybe I should write that down as well. So one of the attributes of this reaction is that the rate depends only on the concentration of an alkyl halide. Second thing about this reaction is for alkyl halides, that are chiral at alpha carbon, the reaction proceeds with racemization. That means you bake both enantiomers of the molecule, okay? You're going to make both enantiomers of the molecule. You may get a racemic mixture there. And so thirdly, rearrangement products are observed, okay? And I think this is something really new, so we'll see this in detail also, but rearrangement products are formed. But if you think about it, uh, this must be some mechanism where there is one step in the mechanism which only has the alkyl halide in it, okay, because that's what this rate is saying. There has to be some step which, which is the rate determining step, and the dependence is only on the concentration of the alkyl halide. Secondly, uh, look at this point, uh, the, the, look at the second point here, okay? The reaction proceeds with racemization. That means you make both enantiomers of the product. Now, when did we see this before? Uh, we saw this in the free radical halogenation reaction when the reaction happened at a carbon that was chiral, when the alpha carbon was chiral. Okay, that is when we saw both 
enantiomers of the product being formed. And the question is, why did that happen? Why did we get both enantiomers of the product? Because that should help us understand why that might happen here as well. Okay, so in that particular case, in free radical halogenation, the reason we get both enantiomers is because we have a radical intermediate, which is sp2 hybridized at that carbon, and it's flat. And so what we noticed is that in that particular case, the bromine could attack from both, or the halogen could attack from both faces of that radical. So if this is the radical carbon, and if this is flat, because this is sp2 hybridized, it has a p orbital bound below, the halogen could come and bind to the bottom carbon, or, or from the bottom side, or it could come and bind from the top face. So the bottom phase or the top phase. And depending on where it, where it would connect from, you get both enantiomers. So if the, we get racemization in this reaction, that suggests that we should have something similar in this reaction also. And when we say similar, what we mean is there should be a flat species in this reaction, okay? Something flat so that then the attack can happen from both faces because that is how we would get a racemic mixture, okay? Now, in this particular case, that intermediate is not a radical, okay? It is a carbocation. So we'll look at the mechanism and how the mechanism actually explains all of these observations that people have uh, from experiments, okay? So the mechanism of this reaction it is suggested that the first step is an ionization, okay? So it's an ionization. And essentially what happens in this step is the tertiary alkyl halide ionizes. So it's not a homolytic cleavage. It is a heterolytic cleavage, okay? The tertiary alkyl halide ionizes. And what happens here is you break this carbon halogen bond. So this is the alpha carbon. You break that alpha carbon bromine bond because this carbon is del positive, that bromine is del negative. So the electron density goes towards the bromine. And what you get here is you get a carbocation plus a bromide. Now in this step, we are breaking a bond we are breaking a bond, which means it should be an endothermic step. So this reaction usually needs input of energy. So that is why we need to heat this reaction to get a good reaction at an appreciable rate. Otherwise it may be like a very slow reaction, okay? So we have to heat the reaction to get like a appreciable rate for the reaction. So the first step is an ionization step. The alkyl halide basically ionizes to carbocation. Now carbocation is just a very general term and we've seen this before uh, when the carbon is positively charged and then we get the halogen. Now important thing here this carbon is now sp2 hybridized that means it's trigonal planar so we've got that flat species that we want. So once we have that carbocation the second step is the attack by nucleophile. And in this particular case, our nucleophile is the solvent. So we have the carbocation, this is positively charged, and our nucleophile, the solvent is around, so we have methanol, And what methanol can do is it can go ahead and attack this carbon because that carbon is positively charged. Now this should be a favorable step uh, because uh, in some sense, if you think of our starting material at the octet complete for all the elements here, and we actually created a carbocation which was missing its octet. That's not a favorable thing to do. You're actually removing octet from atoms. Whereas in this step, we are bringing the two electrons back to the carbocation, so it's feeling stable right now. So you're getting the octet back. So this should give us 
OCH3, now the oxygen used two of its lone, or sorry, one of its lone pairs to form a bond with this carbocation, the carbon. And so the oxygen now only has one lone pair left on it. Now you can draw that lone pair wherever. So it had two lone pairs, now it has one lone pair left. And now the oxygen should also have a positive charge to it because oxygen now has, sorry, the oxygen now has three bonds to it. And I've shown that hydrogen on the oxygen. So this is what it is, essentially. We get something like that. So that's the attack by the nucleophile. Okay, this is the second step. Uh, and <clears throat> ideally, if we can show equilibrium, like whether it's a preferred or a non-preferred step, I can adjust the length of these arrows. So these are all in equilibrium. So this reaction is not so favored in the forward direction because you're actually breaking bonds. Uh, so there will be a tendency for the bromide to combine with the carbocation and come back. That should be more favored. Similarly, in this particular step, the methanol is attacking, it should be more favored. Now, in principle, since you're heating all of this, the methanol could take its electrons and break away and that should be less favored again here. Okay, so we get this. And then the third step in this reaction is a deprotonation, which is basically an acid base reaction. Okay, what happens in this deprotonation step is we have that species. So we have OCH3 with one lone pair, positive charge, hydrogen to it. Now, methanol is our solvent. So there's a lot of the solvent, there's a lot of it around. So what happens is in this third step, another molecule of the methanol it comes and picks up that proton. So it does an acid base, deprotonates the species. The electrons from this bond go to the oxygen atom. And what that would give us is OCH3 with two lone pairs on the oxygen now. So because this, the two electrons in this bond, they came back to the oxygen. So now oxygen got two more electrons, which would become a lone pair. So that came back. And so that is over here. We get this species plus we are going to have CH3. The methanol took up another proton, OH2 plus with one lone pair to it. But essentially what we've got here is our substitution product. So this shows how the reaction works. You know, what is the mechanism, like the step-by-step -step sequence of events that lead, the step-by-step -step sequence of events that lead to the product. How is our product formed? That is actually shown in this mechanism. Okay, so this is the mechanism for the formation of the SN1 product. Now, uh, pictorially, when we were to, if you were to draw all of this out, <coughs> in a reaction profile diagram for lack of space of basically drawing it here. For this mechanism, it turns out if we plot energy in any form, enthalpy maybe, and then if we draw the reaction coordinate on x-axis, energy on the y-axis, and if this is where we start, if these are our react, uh, the reactants, so, Let's say if this is our alkyl halide, then the first step, breaking this bond, is a difficult thing to do. It's endothermic because we're breaking a bond. So it's an endothermic step. So it goes up, comes down, becomes a carbocation. Now, in fact, sorry. It would go up come down and become the carbocation. The carbocation should be less stable than our reactant itself, okay? Uh, because this is a neutral molecule, the carbocation is not. So it becomes uh, the carbocation. This is our intermediate now, okay? That's where the intermediate is. And then the carbocation reacts with the methanol. So this is the second step now. 
and then we have a final step which is an acid base reaction okay so very rough crude drawing here um, to show this okay now essentially we get this and what you can notice here is that this activation energy here this is ea1 this is ea2 and this is ea3 now uh, this final step here so uh, wait so let me go ahead and fill this out this first step is our ionization i hope everyone can see it uh, that's the first step the ionization the second step is here this is step two this is step one and this here is our step three okay so this here is the species where the oxygen is positively charged that species is here and over here is our sn1 product okay now this final step which is step three is an acid base reaction so usually we don't count these proton transfer steps like if it's something that's happening towards the end of the reaction we do not have to count it as part of the reaction <clears throat> so we can say that SN1, so for that reason, we can say that SN1 is a two-step mechanism. SN1 reaction has a two-step mechanism, okay, which is the ionization step and then the attack by the nucleophile. Those are the two important steps for an SN1 reaction because this final step, like I said, it's an acid-base reaction, which means it could go forward or backward. So this product here, it could go pick up a proton from that methanol, the protonated methanol molecule, and then it would come back here, okay? So it's basically going back and forth. In fact, uh, Based on our understanding of uh, PKAs, like which is a stronger acid, which is a weaker acid, you might want to think about these. And what you would realize is they're equally strong acids. They're very similar PKAs. You know, there should not be anything that's like significantly different about them, which means it's going to hit equilibrium nicely. So it's going to be like a mixture of both. So that's why we can kind of discount that from the actual discussion. So we say SN1 reaction is a two-step mechanism here okay so the first step is an ionization process the second step is the attack by the nucleophile the important thing to realize here again is we make a carbocation which is a flat species it's uh now not totally flat but at that carbon okay the carbocationic carbon that is sp2 hybridized and which means the attack by the methanol can happen from both phases now in this particular case it does not matter because our product is not chiral okay so if it is a chiral we don't really have to worry about although the attack is happening from both sides <coughs> it does not result in different products it's going to be the same product Okay, so that is the mechanism of the SN1 reaction. We'll see it again. We'll do another problem where you can see this again, uh, and we will bring in like another feature there. Okay, that's the SN1 mechanism. Oh, actually, I now erased it, but notice from that the profile that I had drawn that the first activation energy is the highest. So that is our rate limiting step uh the rate determining step and that rate determining step is only involves the alkyl halide that is why our rate only has a dependence on the alkyl halide because that's the most difficult thing to do after that everything is like fast pretty fast so they do not uh, uh they do not influence the rate of the reaction as much if the 
alkyl halide can break and become that carbocation, then everything else goes fast, pretty fast compared to the first step. That is why the rate only depends on the alkyl halide, okay? So let's look at another example where we can actually talk about uh, this issue of chirality maybe, okay? And we'll try to draw all the products possible there as well. So let's say we have an alkyl halide Um, yeah, let me see if uh, there is a better Yeah, I think we can do it on a secondary alkyl halide. So let's say if our alkyl halide now is a secondary alkyl halide and Again, I will use a different solvent just to show you how everything works. So what I'll do is I'll use water instead. So let's say we have this alkyl halide. I'm using a hypothetical solvent. We take this in water and we heat this. Okay, so we have water and we are heating this entire thing. So now since we have an alkyl halide, which is chiral here, okay, at that alpha carbon, that's our alpha carbon, it's chiral at the alpha carbon. What that means is when we get products, we're going to get a racemic mixture. So that means our product in this case is going to be this here, where I've used that squiggly line, okay? Or so you can write it like this, or you can say which would imp imply racemic mixture, or you can write it as hydroxyl on a wedge plus enantiomer. So those two would be formed, or you can write plus minus, okay? Any of those notation, any of these notations to basically suggest that it's a racemic mixture that's formed, that would be fine. Now, we've only focused on the SN1 products here, okay? These are all SN1 products, but since SN1 always competes with E1 or they go hand in hand, we should also expect elimination products from this reaction. Okay, and we'll go back, look at this reaction again, but those elimination products, we've seen this alkyl halide before, those are going to be this. That's an elimination because elimination again involves the beta hydrogen. So if this is alpha, we have two beta hydrogens here. We have beta one, beta two, or beta and beta prime. Let's stick to a notation, so beta and beta prime. So we get trans alkene. We should expect cis alkene from there. And plus, we should expect the mono substituted alkene. So we're going to get the di substituted alkenes and we're going to get the mono substituted alkene. The major product again, since that's these are elimination products, these are all. E1 products. The major product again is going to be the more substituted alkene. And if there is EN, Z, or cis and trans possible, then the E alkene. So in this particular case, the major E1 product, okay, so don't read this major as major among all of them. The major E1 product is going to be that trans di substituted alkene similar to E2. So the product distribution or the product selectivity is similar because it's an elimination reaction. Okay, so the stability of the alkene determines the major product here again. Uh, so those are all the products that will be formed in this particular case, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the mechanism of the SN1 reaction again, and E1 will deal it later. Okay, so what would be the mechanism of an SN1 reaction? I shouldn't have erased this, I didn't have to. Okay, so what we're going to see is, if we start here, and if we heat it with water, how do we make this plus its enantiomer 
and maybe I will write it out. So when I say an ion chamber, I'm referring to that molecule. And plus, in this case, the side product is going to be H3O plus, which is a hydronium ion. Okay, uh, that is what we have here. So what would be the mechanism of this reaction? How are these products formed? Again, the first step, and now I'm going to skip writing these, or maybe I'll write it one more time. Okay, uh, so the first step is ionization always for SN1 and E1. And again, the way I know this is an SN1 and an E1 reaction is you have an alkyl halide and we have a weak nucleophile or a weak base, whichever one it might be. Okay, in this particular case, since we're focusing on SN1, it's a weak nucleophile. Okay, uh, first step is ionization. So we start with the alkyl halide. We have bromine. And just to show the complete stereochemistry, realize there is a hydrogen over there. This is our alpha carbon. This is alpha. This is alpha. This is alpha. And this is chiral. This is chiral. That is also chiral. Okay, this is where we are starting. The first step has to be the ionization step. And so in presence of heat or with heat, what's going to happen? is going to basically fall off. It's going to ionize, okay? It's going to ionize. So we're basically kicking out the bromine, which means we should get a carbocation now. Now, so the carbocation is going to be that. Notice how I've changed the hydrogen from a dash to a straight line because the carbocation is sp2 it is sp2 hybridized okay so i've changed that the dash to a line to say that it is trignal planar now it's basically flat species okay another thing i want to point out here is that the the carbocation is formed add alpha carbon. The alpha carbon is what becomes the carbocation after losing the halogen. So we get bromide along with that. Okay, that's the first step. Second step is attack by nucleophile. So, we have this carbocation, which is a flat species. Okay. Uh, that's the carbocation. This is our alpha carbon. And now the solvent shows up, which is water here. So H2O. Now, since this is a flat, part of the molecule, planar part of the molecule, the water can come and attack it from the front side. So I'm using this, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the solid line to suggest that it's attacking from the front side, or the water could attack this carbocation from the back side. So because it's flat, it could come from the front an attack or it could go behind the plane and attacks because it's planar. And what that means is I will get two products. I'm going to get OHH plus with the hydrogen now on a dash because the water attacked from the front side plus I'm going to get this because the water attacked from the back side. So the water attacked from the front side and the water attacked from the back side. So I get two enantiomeric products. So that's where my racemization is going on, basically. That's where it happens, okay? And now for any of these products, okay, and I will show you the third step, which is the 
the deprotonation or the acid base reaction. Okay, so the deprotonation for one of them, I'm going to show it for one of them, but please do it for both of them. So essentially what's happening in the deprotonation step is you have oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen, this is positively charged. These oxygens both have one lone pair to them. Water, that oxygen had two lone pairs to start out with. Water, since it's a solvent, there's a lot of it. Another water molecule comes in, picks up that proton. Okay, this hydrogen is still here. And the electrons in this bond go to the oxygen atom. And that would give us a hydroxyl group there, the oxygen with two electron, two lone pairs now. The hydrogen is still there. Plus, it's going to give us H3O plus. So that is how we get one of the enantiomers. And when this happens on the other enantiomer, we will get the other enantiomeric product. And again, this is acid base. So this is in equilibrium. Sorry, my arrows here. So for all of these reactions, that forward reaction is not favored. Here, the backward reaction is not as favored. You know, so all of those arrow pushes, still, uh, they're still the same. So essentially, we get one of the enantiomeric products. When that one undergoes deprotonation, we're going to get the other enantiomeric product. So that is how we get racemization, or how we get both enantiomer of the product. So please practice to this mechanism a little bit. It will take a lot of work, like sitting and basically doing like problems to get used to all of this. And like I said, because there are several other mechanisms coming. This is just a start. We're going to have several other mechanisms, okay? So that's the mechanism of this reaction, which explains how the racemization happens. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at another example where we are going to bring in another aspect of this SN1 reaction. Okay, we talk about another example that will introduce us to another aspect of this SN1 reaction. So to do that, let's assume that our starting material is this molecule. This is what our starting material is. So again, it's an alkyl halide. And that's an alkyl halide. Uh, so it has a methyl group, an additional methyl group on it. And it is it is still chiral. I think that's fine. It will just complicate things a little bit more, but I think that's fine. Uh, we would understand more as we look at all of this, okay? So, when you take this alkyl halide, and now let's say if you react it with, again, water, and, you, and again, water is like a simple nucleophile or a base solvent, anything to use. That is why I'm using water, but you could use methanol, ethanol, any of those things should not change any of this. In fact, let me go ahead and do it with another one. So let's say we have ethanol. And we heat it with ethanol. So that's another alcohol that I'm using. We've used methanol, we've used water. This is a third alcohol and we're doing a different problem. Actually, you know what, I think it's better to do the water because at least you can make a connection to the previous example. And maybe I'll go and I'll show you later what would happen if it were ethanol, okay? I'll show you that also. Okay, so let's use water so that we can actually draw a direct comparison with our previous example. And notice how, notice like what I changed is I added another methyl group to it. That's all I did here, okay? My alpha carbon is the, still the same. It is still a chiral alpha carbon. So if I take this molecule and heat it with water, again, SN1, E1, that's the reaction that we're trying to do here. It turns out I get
a product like that. In fact, I think on the board, I don't think it's looking that great. So I think we're going to use the enantiomer thing. Okay, so we're going to get this product plus its enantiomer. So SN1 product. But we get additional product plus you're going to get this product here, okay? That's alpha and our alpha carbon is here. So we get another product here. And in this particular case, notice how our alpha carbon was chiral, but this carbon is a chiral. So the wedges and the dashes, they don't really have a lot of meaning to them because they don't differentiate each other. Whether the hydroxyl is on the wedge or the methyl is uh, or on the dash, it's the same molecule because it's an a chiral center. This chiral center is a chiral. In fact, we don't have a chiral center over there either now. Okay, So we get this molecule also as an SN1 product. Okay. And we are going to get, so these are all SN1 products and our E1 products, okay? We're going to get this and you're going to get that. And we're going to get this. These are going to be our E1 products. And along with both of these, we will have H three O plus. So notice how complicated it's getting. Very complicated in terms of like the number of products that we're making. So we're making a mixture of like one, two, three, and another three. So six products. Okay. So what that means is like if I want to synthesize one of these molecules in my research lab or for doing something, I'm not going to use this reaction because it's going to give me six products, and then I'll have to like purify separate them out if I want one of these, you know? So it is, it is a very tedious process. So people don't usually use SN1 and E1 reactions to do, to make things, unless you are, uh, you have one of those examples where there is an exception and it will give you one or the other, like only substitution or elimination, SN1 or E1, then we can use it. Or at least as a major product, okay? So these are all the products that we're going to get from the SN1 and the E1. Uh, reactions on in this alkyl halide. So the big question here is, how do we get these additional products? Because if you look at this, this product here, that makes sense to me because what we've seen so far is we have the alpha carbon, where the halogen is attached, that is where the nucleophile gets attached, okay? So the nucleophile, the hydroxyl, which came from water, is attached to that alpha carbon. But we have an additional product where the nucleophile looks like it attacked a beta carbon. How did that happen? Uh, so there must be something going on here, okay? Uh, which is not pretty evident here, but we can think through it, okay? We can actually think about it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away these elimination products right now, okay? Because that's going to confuse it more. So we'll only discuss or look at the SN1 products, okay? So to help us understand this and you know, maybe brainstorm about it a little bit, why do we or how do we, how does this hydroxyl end up at the alpha carbon? What happens mechanistically? 
So if you think about the mechanism, the first step is an ionization, which generates a carbocation. Then the nucleophile goes and attacks that carbocation, which then leads to this product. Okay. So the nucleophile attacks a carbocation, which leads to the product. So if that is true, what would be required for us to get a product like this? Why would the nucleophile come and attack this carbon, which is a beta carbon? Okay. Uh, maybe there is a carbocation at that beta carbon also, okay, is formed. And that is how we get this product. So that is what we're going to see here. You know, maybe that is what's going on here. And we'll see why would that happen. So this is a beta carbon. And for some reason, we had beta, the hydroxyl of the beta carbon here. Okay. So we'll look at that. Why does this happen? How does this happen? Okay. So I'm going to erase this and we'll start working through the mechanism. I'll write it out, but then we'll start working through the mechanism. I'm going to make it smaller because I think I need a little bit more room for working on this mechanism. So with water, let me set our products, hydroxyl, plus enantiomer, okay? So this is a racemic mixture where this is alpha, this is beta, this is beta prime, uh, sorry. This is beta alpha, beta prime. And we get another product where we have this is beta and that's beta prime. Okay, so we're getting all of these products plus there is H3O plus that will be formed. Okay, so how do we get all of those products? So the mechanism should be able to explain all of that. So mechanistically, What's going on here is that, again, we start with the ionization step and then we do the attack by the nucleophile. So the first step here is going to be the ionization. I'm not going to name those, uh, but we have bromine. This chiral center is there. Sorry, that methyl is over there. This is alpha. Uh, this is beta, this is beta prime. Okay, so the first step is, sorry, is just ionization. So the bromine ionizes to give us a carbocation plus bromide, okay? And this is still our alpha, this is beta, and this is beta prime. Okay, so the first step is the ionization. We lost the bromide ion, we got a carbocation. <clears throat> so now what's going to happen is, and I'm going to box this carbocation because we're going to use this later, okay? So the second step is going to be, let me see if I can fit these side by side. So the second step is going to be, you have the carbocation, alpha, beta prime, and beta. And so our nucleophile, which is water, this can attack this carbocation from the front side, okay, from the front face, 
or it can go and attack this carbocation from the back face. So front side attack, back side attack. I could probably write it here. So front side attack. This is, a, well, no, there's no front face. Okay, this is a front face. This is a back face attack. There's no side, but in front of the board, that's the front face attack. Behind the board is the back face attack. So it attacks there. I think it's getting a bit congested, but I will leave it up there, you know, so we do that. And then we will get racemization in the step. So the front face attack is going to give us oxygen with two hydrogens, one lone pair, positive charge on that oxygen, hydrogen on the dash, plus you're going to get its enantiomer. Okay, which again, I will draw it. When we say enantiomer, we are referring to that molecule. So we get its enantiomer. Okay, so that is how the racemization is going on and that's how we get to these products. Because then what's going to happen in a third step is if we use one of these, what's going on here again is we have that this reacts with water. <clears throat> More water comes and deprotonates, removes one of those hydrogen atoms. Electrons go to that oxygen. I'm going to get a hydroxyl plus we are going to get H3O plus. Okay, and again, realize that all of these have directionality to them, uh, not favored. This is favored uh, equilibrium. So that's how we get one of the enantiomeric products. And then when we use this other enantiomer and do this acid-base reaction, we're going to get the other enantiomeric product, okay? So that explains how we get this, okay? But doesn't explain how we get this other product. So how do we get this other product, okay? So I'm going to erase this part and show you how we get that other product. So what happens here is, and a very important thing about carbocations, okay, which we are going to use in later chapters as well, a very important concept. And we've already kind of talked about carbocation stability later. So one very, thing important, one very important thing to remember is carbocations can rearrange from a less stable carbocation to a more stable carbocation on an adjacent carbon. So very important, you know, that carbon has to be adj adjacent now. It happens over longer range orders, but that's not the concern right now. We will not be talking about those, okay? So for our purposes, it is rearrangement when it happens to an adjacent carbon atom, okay? 
Now, what does this mean? Okay, we'll see that in this example. So if I redraw that carbocation, this is our carbocation on that alpha carbon. Okay. And this is a secondary carbocation because the carbon that's positively charged is secondary in nature. It's connected to two other carbon containing groups. This is a hydrogen that does not count. So two other carbon containing groups. So it is a secondary carbocation. Now, if we look at beta prime, this is a primary carbon. Okay, so beta prime is primary, but beta, beta here is a tertiary carbon. And realize that carbocations are stabilized through hyperconjugation. Uh, so if you wanna see that, please go back to the video on carbon-based intermediates. I discussed carbocation stabilization over there. And so what happens is because of that, because this beta carbon is tertiary and the hydrogen here is actually involved in hyperconjugation with the carbocation, so this secondary carbocation knows that there is a tertiary position right next to it. And then what happens is we see a migration. Okay, we call it a shift. So this hydrogen here takes its electrons and shifts over to that position where the carbocation is. So it is going with its electrons, okay? I want to draw it out a little bit more clearly. So, so we have that carbon, we have the hydrogen here, that hydrogen takes the two electrons. So it is taking both electrons and moves over to that secondary carbon, which is the alpha carbon. And what would this give us when this hydride, we call it a hydride shift, okay? When this hydride shift happens, it's going to give us a new carbocation, but now at this beta carbon, and the alpha carbon would get another hydrogen. So there are two hydrogens on that alpha carbon now, and it is a chiral. So this is alpha, this is beta prime. So the beta carbon now becomes carbocationic because of the hydride shift. And the reason this happened is because we started with a secondary carbocation, but after this hydride shift, we have a tertiary carbocation, okay? We've got a tertiary carbocation now, which is more stable, okay? And now once this carbocation is formed, sorry for lack of space, I'm going to write it here. So once this carbocation is formed, that tertiary carbocation is formed, this is the carbocation, uh, this is the tertiary carbocation. Once this is formed, this is a new carbocation. Water molecule, which is our solvent, which is a nucleophile, it will come in and it will attack this carbocation from the front or it could attack that carbocation from the back because that carbocation is again planar. Uh, that carbocation is planar, so it can attack from the front or the back. But in this particular case, this carbon is not chiral anymore because there are two methyl groups on it, so it really doesn't matter. But what we're going to get is, we are going to get this product. We can show it like this. You can show the hydroxyl on a wedge or a dash, but it doesn't matter because this is an achiral carbon now. 
uh, a chiral. It's an it's not a chiral center. Okay, so uh, it's not a stereo center. So we get a new carbon where the hydroxyl, sorry, not the hydroxyl, uh, the water molecule attacked. So you're going to get one lone pair with positive charge on the oxygen atom. And then we get that acid base step again. So this is favored again. And so we get an acid base step after this. So we have methyl this more water comes in, picks up one of those protons, electrons go to the oxygen atom. This is a reversible step. That's going to give me the hydroxyl over there. And plus, it's going to make hydronium ion at the same time. Okay, so that is how we get this other SN1 product. In fact, between these two SN1 products, okay, this product, this is actually the major product because it's coming from a more stable carbocation. It's coming from a tertiary carbocation compared to this product, which is coming from a secondary carbocation. Okay, uh, so that is a SN1 reaction. So now like I promised, I'm going to show you what sort of products form if we did this with another uh, another molecule, let's say. You know, what would happen if the same reaction were done with another solvent? So let me show that to you. So if we had the starting material, and this is alpha, and I'm going to use now a bigger molecule as a solvent. So let's say if this is the polar product solvent that I'm using. And if I heated this with this polar product solvent, the products that I'm going to get are Plus it's an antimer, so please work through a mechanism of how you would get to this product because again, practice is the only way to kind of see all the connections and then know what happens. So we're going to get that product and we're going to get this product. Those are the SN1 products. Uh, the E1 products are going to be the same. They're identical to what we saw in the previous case, so the beginning of this thing, go back to that. But these would be our SN1 products. So please write a mechanism out for how these products would be formed, starting from this alkyl halide and that alcohol as a solvent, okay? Uh, another thing I wanna point out is that uh, carbocation rearrangements, are not just based on hydrogen. So it's not just a hydride that shifts. So I wanna give you an example for that and please work through a mechanism of that also. So let's say if we start with an alkyl halide like this, let's say this is the alkyl halide. And we react this with water, with heat, and I'm only going to write SN1 products. So SN1 reaction is what we're focusing on, but realize that E1 always competes with SN1, but I'm just writing products for an SN1 reaction because that's the mechanism that I want you guys to practice. So if you start with this alkyl halide, you're going to get This alcohol plus it's an antimer, and along with that, you're going to get this alcohol. Okay, and so this happens because 
a methyl group can actually migrate to the carbocation. So as you work through the mechanism, migrate a methyl group instead of a hydrogen because this is a quaternary carbon now. So when the methyl group migrates, you get a tertiary carbocation again, and that would lead you to that product. So please practice these mechanisms. And the mechanism is pretty similar. You go do the same thing over and over again. Okay, like whatever steps we've shown you, like already like three times or so. So basically the same thing over and over again. But please practice these things uh, to see what happens. And again, in this particular case, this SN1 product is our major product, okay? Because that's coming from a more stable carbocation. So that is everything that I wanted to talk about SN1. Uh, now that we've discussed SN1, E1 should be a shorter uh, discussion. Uh, so I will do E1 in, the, in, in a subsequent video.